In our final podcast on the eye, we're going to talk first about the lens, and then we're going to talk about the posterior portions of the eye, essentially the retina. Now, as you know, the lens is a crystalline structure. It's suspended between the edges of the ciliary body by the zonular fibers. The lens is transparent, it's avascular, and it's biconvex. Tension on the zonular fibers makes the lens flat. Release of tension makes the lens fat. And this is necessary for accommodation to bend light rays that are originating from objects close to the eye so they can be focused on the retina. Now the structure of the lens, there's a capsule, which is essentially a basal lamina that's produced by anterior lens cells. There's uh, collagen type 4 plus proteoglycans. The lens is naturally elastic and it's thickest at the equator. There's a subcapsular epithelium. This is a layer of cuboidal cells on the anterior surface of the lens. These cells have abundant gap junctions in them and few organelles. And then there are lens fibers. These are remnant cells that are derived from the subcapsular lens epithelial cells. Now, the lens continuously increases in size, but growth is going to slow throughout a person's life. The lens fibers are highly elongated, flat structures. They're, as I said, remnants of cells, and they're filled with crystalline proteins. Now, the lens does change with age. So, for example, presbyopia, the, there's a loss of elasticity in the lens, so you can't accommodate to close objects. And that usually occurs around the fourth decade of life. A lot of individuals that are in their 40s and older, for example, need to use reading glasses. Cataracts, there's a loss of transparency in the lens. Essentially, that's due to conformational changes in some of the crystalline proteins in the lens. These cartoons and the micrograph just look at the lens structure and growth. Note that growth is only occurring from the anterior surface. Uh, here are the lens fibers. The oldest cells are in the central region of the lens, the so-called nucleus. Then the little diagram down here correlates to what we see here. Essentially, the lens cells are layered like an onion, but they bow from the anterior to the posterior midline, and they're joined in these suture-type structures. This is a histological view of the lens. So here's the lens capsule, which is essentially the basal lamina of the epithelium on the subcapsular surface. And these epithelial cells are essentially forming the lens fibers. And the lens fibers are remnants of these lens epithelial cells. They're just remnants of cells, no more organelles, but they're packed full of crystalline proteins. In one sense, they're almost analogous to red blood cells and that they lose all the organelles. And like red blood cells have no organelles and they're packed full of hemoglobin, the lens fiber cells have lost all their organelles, but they're packed full of crystalline proteins. And the, again, these crystalline proteins are in such a regular arrangement that the lens becomes transparent. In the remainder of this podcast, we're going to talk about the posterior region of the eye. So we're going to talk about the retina. If you go through with the eye walls, of course, you have the sclera, the outer part of the eye wall, the choroid, the middle layer, and then the retina itself. The inner layer is the retina. The neural retina, as you know, contains light-sensitive receptors and many other cell types that make up a complex neural network. The retinal pigment epithelium is the outer layer of the retina. It's a simple layer of cuboidal cells that contain a lot of melanin. As we've said, the neural retina goes from the aura serrata all the way around the back and most of the eye itself, certainly around 80%, 75-80% of the eye. The non-neural retina is the anterior portion of the retina beginning at the aura serrata. And in the laboratory, you'll see this termed as the iridial retina. There is a potential space that can occur between the neural and pigmented layers of the retina, and that can lead to retinal detachment. You'll hear more about that in your clinical settings.
as we said, the anterior portion of the retina is the non-visual portion of the retina. The choroid is a vascular coat, the middle layer of the eye wall. We've talked about that before. It lies deep to the retina. There's a chorocapillary layer that's a capillary rich network in the choroid and that's going to supply nutrients to cells of the retina and here is the chorocapillary layer and at the electron microscopic level you can see there are it's a got a rich blood supply with arterioles and venules and notice the capillary network here and then here would be the retinal pigment epithelium the optic disc, I think, as you know, would be the optic papilla. It's the blind spot on the eye. It's the site where the optic nerve joins the retina. There are no photoreceptor cells here. The optic nerve itself contains axons of retinal ganglion cells. The fovea centralis is the visual axis of the eye. So if you could imagine light rays coming in, that would be the focal point. It's the point of greatest visual acuity. It's got the highest concentration of photoreceptor cells and they're essentially just cones in that layer. In the histological image you can note that the other cell layers in the retina are thinning out. There are also no blood vessels in the fovea centralis. In the most simple-minded sense, the retina can be viewed essentially as a three-neuron circuit. So here would be the photoreceptors, the rods and cones, the bipolar cells would be interneurons, and the ganglion cells would be the third neuron in that neural network. The rods and cones synapsing onto the bipolar cells, the bipolar cells synapsing onto the ganglion cells and sending their axons into the optic nerve and into the brain. So, like I said, in the simplest terms, the retina is essentially a three-neuron circuit. Histophysiology is way more complicated than that, because if it was just a three-neuron circuit, you'd only be able to discern vague shapes and shadows. Clearly, the retina is much more than a three-neuron circuit. So there are multiple cell types in the retina, and we're going to go over some of these. So you can look at incident light coming into the eye and coming, having to pass through all these cells in the retina to get to the photosensitive regions of the rods and cones. Now let me just highlight on this cartoon first just a, a couple of points. Here are the photosensitive rods and cones. The photosensitive parts of the rods and cones are in the very back of the retina. Here's where they react with light. I want to point out just these as Mueller cells, just are essentially large supporting cells of the retina. We're going to talk about all of these layers as we go along in the rest of this podcast. So here's the histological orientation of the retina. The cell types in the retina, there are photoreceptor cells, so there are rods, there are cones, and there's a specialized photosensitive retinal ganglion cell that we'll talk about at the end of the podcast. There are conducting neurons, and this would be of the simple three neuron circuit these conducting neurons are bipolar neurons and ganglion cells but of course there are many association neurons that make the retina more than a three neuron cell circuit the main ones we're going to talk about are the horizontal cells and amacrine cells but it turns out that research done on retinas from a variety of primate species suggest that there are many types of association neurons. There have been at least 15 types that have been described and they describe something like 35 to 38 different types of synapses. And then there are supporting cells in the retina, so-called neural glial cells. The Mueller cells are the ones we're going to talk about here. They provide the scaffolding for the entire retina. But of course there are other microglial cells and astrocytes in the retina because remember the retina is essentially part of the central nervous system. As we said, the histology of the retina is fairly complex. It's described in 10 histological layers that I'm going to just name for you and then we're going to talk about them as we go. There's a retinal pigment epithelium. There's a layer of rods and cones. The third layer is an outer limiting membrane which you can just barely see and the outer limiting membrane is essentially the apical portions of the Mueller cells. There's an outer nuclear layer. The outer nuclear layer contains the nuclei of the rods and cones. There's an 
outer plexiform layer. We'll talk about that in a minute. There's an inner nuclear layer. In its simple-minded terms, the inner nuclear layer contains the nuclei of bipolar cells, that intermediate neuron in the simple three neural network of the retina. But again, there are many more nuclei there that we'll talk about. There's an inner plexiform layer. We'll talk about that. There's the ganglion cell layer. And then there's the layer of the optic nerve. This is the axons of the ganglion cell layer going through the optic nerve into the brain itself. And then there's the inner limiting membrane, which is essentially the basal lamina of the Mueller cells. Here is the choroid itself, and there's a very distinct membrane here called Bruch's membrane. I don't care that you really remember what Bruch's membrane is, but it is essentially the basal lamina of endothelial cells of the corocapillary network and the basal lamina of the retinal pigment epithelial cells. So the layers of the retina, the retinal pigment epithelium, and these are shown just in the cartoon here, the retinal pigment epithelial cells then processes around the rods and cones, and I'll show you an electron micrograph of this later in the podcast. The adjacent retinal pigment epithelial cells have tight junctions between them, so they form a blood retinal barrier. They absorb light because they have uh, melanin pigments. They nourish the rods and cones, and they phagocytize spent membrane discs from the rods and cones. There's the layer of the rods and cones. There's something like 120 million rods, maybe 7 million cones. We talked about the outer limiting membrane is the apical boundary of the Mueller cells. That's just barely shown like this. The outer nuclear layer contains the cell bodies and of course then the nuclei of the rods and cones. The outer plexiform layer essentially contains axons of the rods and cones, plus it contains processes, dendritic processes of the bipolar cells and then processes of the horizontal and amacrine cells. The inner nuclear layer, shown like this, contains cell bodies and nuclei of the bipolar cells, horizontal cells, and amacrine cells, and also contains nuclei of the Mueller cells. The inner plexiform layer, as shown here, contains processes of the horizontal amacrine cells and bipolar and ganglion cells. So you might think of it as containing, if you think about the simple three-circuit neuron network in the retina, it would contain the axons of the bipolar cells and the dendrites of the ganglion cells. This is the ganglion cell layer. Of course, it contains the cell body and nuclei of the ganglion cells. Here is the layer of the optic nerve, which is essentially containing the axons of the ganglion cells that are going all the way into the brain. And then not really so visible here would be the inner limiting membrane. That would contain the basal lamina of the Mueller cells. The photoreceptor cells are shown diagrammatically here. And understand, the photoreceptors are actually modified neurons. The rods are more sensitive to light. They use used in low light conditions. They provide us with a black and white image. The membrane discs, which contain the photosensitive pigments, the membrane discs and the rods lose continuity with the plasma membrane. Rhodopsin is the visual pigment of the rods. The cones have three different response classes. They provide us with a color image. They're less sensitive to low light, but they're highly sensitive to light in the red, green, and blue ranges of the visual spectrum. So for example, there are some cones that are most sensitive to 588 nanometers, the wavelength of red light. There are cones that are most sensitive at 531 nanometers, the wavelength of green light. And there are cones that are most sensitive at 420 nanometers, the wavelength of blue light. Each cone has a visual pigment that's activated specifically at these different wavelengths. The membrane discs of the cones retain continuity with the plasma membrane and the visual pigments in the cone discs are idopsins. Now the photoreceptors have three components. There's the outer segment which contains the photosensitive membrane discs. They're 
essentially stacks of horizontal membrane discs that have these rhodopsins or iodopsins embedded in them. There's the connecting stalks, which here are associated with these calicyl processes. Connecting stock is actually a modified cilium. There are nine doublets, but there's no central doublet, and these emanate from a basal body. And then the inner segment is a, got a typical complement of organelles. Again, remember, these are highly modified neurons. This electron micrograph shows the photosensitive regions of rods on the left and cones on the right. Notice the stacked membrane disks. The membrane disks and the cones retain continuity with the plasma membrane. Thus, the interior of the disks is continuous with the extracellular space, and that's visible at these arrows. The sectional plane through the rod shows a centriole like that, as well as the basal body and cilium of the connecting stalk. The membrane discs, as we said, contain the photosensitive pigments, and many membrane discs are shed daily, and an equal number of new discs has to be synthesized daily. And depending on the species, hundreds to thousands of membrane discs can be shed and synthesized daily. I think in humans, there are probably a few hundred membrane discs that are shed and synthesized daily from the rods and cones. Here's an electron micrograph of the retinal pigment epithelium. Notice the microvilli that are coming out from the apical surface of these cells, and notice how they're enveloping the photosensitive rods and cones. You can clearly see melanin granules here, and you can see phagosomes, which are functioning to phagocytize spent portions of the membrane disks. And then this arrow is highlighting a zonula occludens, or tight junctions, between two of the retinal pigment epithelial cells. And then finally, the retina has a third photoreceptor. It's called an intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cell. And notice that the cell body is actually in the ganglion cell layer, and it sends out its dendritic or receptive processes in this inner plexiform layer. The intrinsic photosensitive retinal ganglion cells don't function to form an image. Rather, they function to measure the intensity of ambient light. So they're going to send projections to areas of the brain that are regulating circadian rhythm, the so-called suprachiasmatic nucleus in the hypothalamus. They're also going to send projections through the paraventricular nuclei all the way to the pineal gland to regulate synthesis and secretion of melatonin. And they're going to form part of a reflex arc that's going to control pupillary muscles in the iris, so it's going to control the size of the pupil.